Welcome to Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us at snoozecast.com, and if you enjoy our show, please share us with a friend. This episode is brought to you by Luscious Fruits. Tonight, we'll read the first voyage from Sinbad the Sailor, edited by Lawrence Houseman and published in 1900. Houseman was a prolific English writer and playwright, an activist and an illustrator during the Victorian era. Turning from visual art to writing, when his eyesight began to fail, he also advocated tirelessly for the women's right to vote and believed that men should be an active participant of the suffrage movement. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to find our episode titled The Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor that aired on January 13th, 2020. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. In Baghdad, there was a rich merchant named Sinbad the Sailor, the source of whose wealth was a mystery. It seemed to be inexhaustible. For long seasons, he kept open house, and his entertainments were the most magnificent of all. All that riches could buy seemed at his disposal, and he lavished the good things of this life upon his guests. Pages, servants, and attendants there were in great number. His garden was spacious and beautiful, and his house was filled with every costly luxury. This Sinbad the Sailor has a story to tell the story of his life, but he never told it to any until, one day, there came to him one Sinbad the Landsman, a man of poor and humble birth. This man pleased him greatly with an apt recitation dealing with the widely different lots dispensed by God to men, and, being pleased, he was struck with the happy conceit that, now, Sinbad the sailor was at last confronted with Sinbad the landsman. It would be no bad thing were he to narrate the story of his life so that all might know his strange adventures and conjecture no longer as to the source of his fabulous wealth. Accordingly, Sinbad the sailor held seven receptions on seven different days, and... Although on each occasion a multitude of guests were assembled to listen, he failed not to address his words from first to last to his simple listener, Sinbad the Landsman. Following is his narration of the strange and wonderful adventures he experienced in his seven voyages. The first voyage 
of Sinbad the Sailor. My father was a merchant of high rank and rich possessions. He died when I was but a child, leaving me all his wealth. When I reached manhood's estate, I used my inheritance with no thought for the morrow, living in a sumptuous manner and consorting with the richest young men of Baghdad. I continued this life for many years until, at last, when reason prevailed with me to mend my plan, I found with dismay that I had sunk to poverty. And then it was that I arose and sold what goods remained to me for three thousand pieces of silver and girded myself, resolving to travel to other lands and rebuild my fortune by the wit of my mind and the labor of my hands. With a part of my hoard, I bought merchandise for exchange in far lands, and also such things as I should require in my travels. Thus prepared, I set sail with a company of merchants in a ship bound for the city of El Basra. For many days and nights we sailed upon the sea, visiting lands and passing thence to other islands. And everywhere we bartered and bought and sold. At length we came to an island unlike the others. It seemed like a garden that had floated from off the sides of paradise and established itself in the sea. And here, our ship cast anchor, and we landed. Then fires were lighted, and while some cooks, others washed in the cool stream, and yet others amused themselves, admiring the beauties of the place. When all had eaten of the food prepared, the shore became a happy scene of sport and play, in which I engaged to the full. But suddenly, a cry from the master of the ship put an end to our gaiety. Standing at the side of the vessel, he called loudly, Hear me, and may God preserve you. Hasten back and leave everything. Save yourselves, for this that ye think is an island is not such. It is a mighty fish lying entranced in sleep on the surface of the sea since times of old, and trees have grown upon it, but your fires and frolicking have awakened it, and lo, it moves, and if it sink into the sea, ye will assuredly be drowned. Hasten then, and save yourselves." At this we all, with one accord, left everything and fled for the ship, hoping to escape. While we were making for safety, the island moved with a great turmoil and sank behind us in the sea. 
and the waves leapt against each other above it. For a time, I gave myself up for lost, for I was drawn down fathoms deep. But, by God's grace, I rose again to the surface, and to my hand was one of the large wooden bowls which some of the passengers had taken on shore for the purpose of washing. This I seized and established myself in it, and thus combated the leaping waves, steadying myself with my hands and feet. In vain I called on the master of the ship. He heard me not. He had spread his sails and pursued his way, thinking that none beside those who had been taken up were left alive. Astride my wooden bowl, I gazed longingly at the ship until it was out of sight. Then I prepared as the night was closing around me. Perchance I swooned, for I remembered naught else until I found myself stranded upon a mountainous island. There were trees overhanging, and I grasped a drooping bough and drew myself up from the fretting wave. My limbs were benumbed, and, on looking at my legs, I saw the marks made by the nibbles of fish and marveled at my salvation. Staggering forward, I flung myself high on the beach like one dead, and so I remained until the dawn of the next day, when the sun, rising upon me, woke me to a sense of such a condition as I had never known before. Long, long it was before I could rise to a sitting posture, and longer still before I could crawl on my hands and knees to a space of grass that was shielded from the sun. Thence, in time, I staggered till I came to a brook of which I drank, and strength returned to me. I found luscious fruits and ate of them, and drank again of the clear waters of the brook. And so I continued many days roaming the island and wondering at its beauties, until I was strong again, as before. And it chanced, as I took my way to and fro in the island, reveling in the sight of things that God had set there, that on a day when the sea was sounding loudly on the shore, I beheld something in the distance which excited my curiosity. It seemed like a wild animal of gigantic size, and, as I approached, I feared it was some fabulous beast of the sea. But, as I drew still nearer, 
I was overcome with amazement to see a beautiful mare standing high with mane and tail floating on the breeze. She was tethered to a stake on the shore and, at sight of me, she screamed loudly and stamped her forefeet on the sand. But, ere I turned to flee, I beheld a man come forth from a cave nearby, and he ran after me, calling on me to give an account of my presence and of my place. Thereupon I laid my story before him, sparing no detail, even to the wooden bowl by means of which and by the grace of God I had come thither. Gladness seized him at my recital, and he took my hand, saying, Come with me. He led me into his cave and set food before me. I ate and ate until I was satisfied, and, being at my ease, I repeated my story more minutely, and he wondered thereat. Then I said, Thou hast the truth of my adventures upon the sea. Now I pray thee, O my master, to tell me how thou art, that thou dwellest hidden in a cave while thy mare is tethered on the shore. He was in no way displeased at my curiosity, but answered me in plain words. I am one of the grooms of the King El Majra, he said, and the others are scattered about the island. For, look you, friend, it is the time of the new moon when the sea horse cometh up out of the sea, and it is our plan to bring our best mares hither and tether them by the shore so that they may lure the seahorses into our hands. While I was wondering at the manner of this cunning device, a magnificent seahorse rose from the waves, shaking the foam from its crest and neighing loudly. As it approached, my companion drew me into the cave and placed himself at the opening with a long coil of thick cord in his hand. Presently, by means of this, he lashed the seahorse with great dexterity and fettered him. Then, with the mare and the seahorse, he led me to his companions, who, when they heard my story, were all of one mind that I should accompany them to the city of the king. So they mounted me on one of the mares, and I rode with them to the king's palace. As soon as we had arrived at the palace gates, they went in to the king and informed him of my strange adventures. Whereupon he sent for me, and they led me before him. He greeted me very courteously, 
and bade me tell him my story, which, when he had heard it, filled him with amazement, so that he cried, By Allah, my son, of a truth thou art favored by fate, for how else couldst thou escape so great a peril? Praise God for thy deliverance. And he made much of me, and caused me to be treated with honor. And he appointed me master of the harbor, and comptroller of the shipping. My condition, then, was no longer that of a wayfarer. I rose day by day to a higher and a higher place in the king's favor, and he took me into his counsel in all affairs of state. For a long time I served him well, and he ceased not to recompense me with a liberal hand. Yet my thoughts turned ever to Baghdad, the abode of peace. But when I inquired of merchants and travelers and masters of ships in which direction it lay and how one might come at it, they one and all shook their heads at the name of the strange city of which they had never heard. At last, weary of the wonders of that island and the sea around it, wonders the which, if I had time to tell you, would cause you the greatest amazement. Wearied, too, with my arduous duties, but most of all with my prolonged absence from my own land. I stood one day on the seashore when a great ship drew near and a number of merchants landed from it. The sailors brought forth their merchandise, and, when I had made an account of it, I inquired of the master of the ship if that were the whole of his cargo. All, O oh my master, he replied, all save some bales whose owner was drowned on our voyage hither. But even these, being in my charge, I desire to sell on behalf of his family in Baghdad. Sayest thou so? I cried. Tell me, I pray thee, the name of the owner of these goods. And he replied, His name was Sinbad the sailor and he was drowned on our way hither. When I heard this, I regarded him more closely and recognized him. Then I cried out, O oh, my master, I am he, and they are my goods that are in thy hold. But he neither recognized me nor believed my words, whereupon I narrated to him the history of my supposed death. But he shook his head and called upon Allah to witness that there was neither faith nor conscience in any. Look you, he said, thou heardst me say the owner was dead, and therefore thou desirest the goods for thyself free of price. 
I tell thee we saw him sink into the sea with many others. O my master, I answered, hear me and then judge of my veracity. With this I narrated to him many trivial things, which happened before we reached the great fish island, and which could never be known to me had I not been on the ship. And then it was that he and many of the merchants regarded me with fixed looks and recognized me. By Allah, said they one and all, we truly believe thee drowned, but here we find thee alive. And they pressed upon me and congratulated me, and the master of the ship gave me my goods, at sight of which I was overjoyed, and they all rejoiced with me. Mindful of the king I served, I at once opened my bales and, selecting the most costly articles, went in to him and laid them at his feet, telling him how I had regained the goods of which they were a part. And the king wondered greatly at my good fortune and graciously accepted my gifts. He also showed me great favor and honor in that he bestowed upon me gifts in return for mine. Then, having sold my remaining goods at a profit, bought largely of the merchandise of the city, and, when the ship was about to sail, I approached the king and thanked him for the great kindness to me and humbly begged his leave to depart to my own city and family. So he gave me his blessing and a great wealth of merchandise and rare commodities and bade me farewell. And soon thereafter, having stowed all my goods in the hold of the ship, I set sail with the others for Baghdad. Our voyage was fortunate, and with the aid of favorable winds, we reached the city of El Basra in safety. Thence I repaired to Baghdad, and my family and my friends gave me a joyous welcome. And when I had sold my merchandise, I set up a large establishment, sparing no cost. And I bought land and houses and gathered round me wealthy companions in whose society I soon forgot how I had suffered in other lands. Such is the story of my first voyage. And tomorrow, by God's grace, I will narrate to you the strange adventures of my second voyage.